Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the new and more recent discoveries, and also somewhat surprising discoveries, about the phenomenon known as Aurora. Although in this case we're talking about a more unusual phenomenon that is often linked or associated with Aurora itself. A phenomenon that's sometimes referred to as the auroral sounds. A somewhat difficult to hear type of sound that's often heard during the Aurora, especially the ones that are extremely strong that has been previously compared to the sound of a waterfall, a kind of a popping and a crackling sound, and a sound resembling static electricity. In other words, there is no one description of this phenomenon, but it's been sort of reported here and there for many, many decades. But it wasn't until 2012 when the Finnish uh, scientists have finally revealed the actual recordings of these sounds confirming their existence, because previously it wasn't really certain if they were real or if it was just someone's imagination which sort of relates to this other video from not so long ago in regards to these so-called earthquake lights, the lights that have also been reported for many years, but that have been previously thought to be maybe some kind of a folklore or just someone's imagination. You can actually learn a little bit more about this in one of the videos in the description. But unlike earthquake lights, the auroral sounds have been definitely reported and recorded, so this was a real phenomenon. But it just nobody really knew how exactly it works, and what exactly makes it happen, or even what produces it. And so the recent research finally explains it, and sort of suggests that it's maybe not really correct to call it auroral lights, because the lights themselves are not entirely responsible for the formation of the sound, and the sounds also seem to happen without the lights. But more about this in a few minutes. First, aurora. What exactly are they, in case you didn't know, and what do we know and not know about them? Well, as you can probably imagine, this is a phenomenon that humans have been observing for thousands of years, and very likely since our origin on the planet. There are actual written reports from ancient China, from ancient Greece, from a lot of ancient cultures that didn't really understand what they were looking at, but they saw them and they marveled at their existence. But it was really in the last 200 years that we finally realized what's happening here. Here's a painting from 1865, the painting simply titled Aurora Borealis. With the discovery of the magnetic field of our planet, and the advance of technology such as, for example, telegraphs, the scientists finally realized that all of this is electromagnetic in nature. With some of the first observations, calculations and discoveries coming from the famous Carrington event, when the aurora were observed really, really far south, including uh, cities like New York, and where the electromagnetic interference was so strong that not only did it damage certain telegraphs, but certain telegraphs were even operated without any battery by using electricity from the aurora. Or to be more exact, from the charge that was formed as a result of a very powerful geomagnetic storm. Which means that the sun is responsible for all of this. And so very highly charged particles coming from our sun during certain types of storms will usually get deflected by the magnetosphere of our planet and then propel down into the southern and the northern pole with many of these charged particles, very often electrons, although in some cases also charged hydrogen, colliding with the upper atmosphere of our planet and then, as a result, charging some of the atomic particles that are present in the Earth's atmosphere. And although they interact with pretty much everything in the atmosphere, it's really only the excitation of nitrogen and oxygen that produces all of the light. With the main principle being relatively simple and visible right here. When these charged particles hit either nitrogen or oxygen, they excite the molecules, which then usually stay in this excited state for at least a few seconds. Here's another way of kind of imagining it. But this excited state doesn't last very long, and after a few seconds, the energy is released as a photon, which is usually visible in a very specific frequency of light, with the color itself being formed by the different types of energy produced and a different level of excitation or the different type of a molecule, and also to some extent depending on the total density of the gas present in the atmosphere. So for example, at higher altitudes, and here we're talking about above 100 kilometers above the ground, so basically in space. The concentration of atoms is really low, but it's predominantly oxygen. And here the excited atomic oxygen usually ends up emitting a lot of red light, 630 nanometers in wavelength. But it's generally only visible when the magnetic storm is very intense because of the overall low density of the atoms here. So in other words, a lot of atoms have to become excited in order for us to observe red aurora. Which is why the most frequent colors and the ones that we see the most are usually green. 557 nanometers, which usually also happens at lower altitudes and is also produced by oxygen as well. But in this case, it's due to the presence of nitrogen. And it's the excited molecule of nitrogen colliding with oxygen that then transfers some of the energy to oxygen, which results in the production of green light. 
with pink and yellow also being produced in the same way as well, but it would basically be in a mix of two colors. So if we were to combine all of this, it would kind of look like this. But there's also obviously nitrogen that's involved sometimes, and this is usually something that happens at lower altitudes. And that's because at lower altitudes, molecular nitrogen takes over and becomes a lot more prominent. And here it often emits its light as either blue or red depending on the amount of energy received. And that naturally results in red, blue, but often purple aurora as well. But all of this is only possible because of the lower concentrations of oxygen and nitrogen in the upper atmosphere. Once the air density increases enough, the excitations and the release of energy as visual light becomes more or less impossible. Which is also why we don't generally see these effects much closer to the ground. And by the way, by studying the aurora and understanding that density and presence of oxygen and nitrogen seems to play a big role in their formation, in theory it could become possible to remotely measure the amounts of oxygen and nitrogen in various exoplanets out there. But that's of course something that we can only do once we are able to see the colors coming from those particular planets. At the moment it's not possible. But that's just a very simple version of the aurora. By itself, the phenomenon is really complex. There are also things like proton aurora, which are usually formed by excited hydrogen. There are also some additional phenomena like flickering aurora, black aurora, or even red arcs. And even more recently discovered and very poorly understood phenomena such as Steve, strong thermal emission velocity enhancement discovered by citizen scientists back in 2016, picket fence aurora, which are also visible here as well, and the phenomenon discovered only a couple of years ago known as the auroral dunes. So there are still a lot of secrets and a lot of unknown details about the phenomena, with many of them formed in a slightly different way from one another. On top of this, other types of aurora exist around other planets, for example Saturn and Jupiter, both of which produce it in a different way. And not so long ago we talked about some of the discoveries in regards to the Martian aurora, which seem to be only visible in the ultraviolet light. Which means that there are still so many unanswered questions in regards to the aurora in general. But what about those sounds? Well, first of all, the actual recording of the sounds was only made back in 2004. Here's kind of what it sounds like. With this of course serving as an official confirmation that these phenomena are real and seem to exist. But many scientists were not happy with this because it didn't really make sense. How can a visual phenomenon approximately 100 kilometers up in the air produce an audible sound that we can then hear on planet Earth? As a matter of fact, one of the first explanations back in the early 2000s was that maybe it was an illusion. Maybe it's somehow related to the phenomenon known as the McGurk effect. And that's actually a very well known illusion where our complex brains are able to perceive sound simply from the visual observation itself. I think one of the most common examples involves making certain sounds with your mouth but not actually hearing anything, yet our brain are somehow able to hear the sound. Here's I guess an example. So in this case, through visual perception, we're able to sort of hear the sounds. With my favorite example being this. I mean, you can literally hear him say whoa, even though this is just a gif that has no sound attached to it. And so these were some of the initial explanations. Maybe by looking at the aurora, which are visual, we could somehow hear the electrical buzzing or cracking that our brains were sort of interpreting as a result of visual observation. But some scientists were not happy with this and they managed to catch the sounds in action and record them. Which presented a problem because there was still no explanation for how they were formed and why exactly the aurora were able to do this. And that's of course until the recent discovery from the same people that recorded the original sounds. It looks like it has pretty much nothing to do with aurora at all, but it does have something to do with geomagnetic interaction and with the load of magnetic field in the planet. With the recent recording of the sounds being done when there was no aurora visible in the night skies. And so here's how the scientists think it works. On a cold, clear and relatively calm night, the atmosphere usually forms different layers. There is usually a cold layer underneath and a slightly warmer air above it. Something that happens in very low wind conditions. And this layering seems to play a really big role in the production of the sounds. The presence of cold air and warm air ends up producing different types of charges on both sides. So we'll have a lot of negative charge on one side and a lot of positive charge on the other. And because nothing is disturbed yet, the charge will start accumulating and become stronger and stronger. And this is when any kind of a geomagnetic disturbance, such as a solar storm or really anything that affects the magnetic lines of our planet, can suddenly change everything. 
The disturbance in these layers reconnects the charges and causes an electrical discharge which is usually audible but not visible. And depending on the type of a discharge will produce different types of sounds, anything from crackling to possibly even sound of a waterfall. With the most important discovery in this case being that, well, it has nothing to do with aurora whatsoever. It can happen because of any kind of a geomagnetic disturbance, which has now been confirmed and detected by the scientists behind all of this. They were even able to actively predict approximately 90% of these auroral sounds, simply measuring the geomagnetic data from our planet and not aurora. Which simply means that aurora are not responsible for the sounds, but both phenomena are more or less produced in the same way. They are produced by geomagnetic interaction of our planet with a lot of other phenomena. Which also means that we can probably now assign a slightly different name to this phenomenon, simply because they have nothing to do with aurora, and simply because they are a phenomena that happen much closer to the planet, at an altitude of anywhere between 70 to maybe 100 meters. So this is actually something we can technically even measure using physical devices. But because this is such a rare phenomenon, this is why it took so long for all of this to be measured and for all of this to be explained. Now, as you can probably imagine, it only happens in those very specific conditions. Cold air, warm air, and very, very little wind. Something that we can probably only find in certain regions of the planet. And so discovering where this happens and, of course, how often this occurs would probably be the next logical step. And so once we discover more about the phenomenon, I'll make sure to follow this up in another video. Until then, thank you for watching, maybe subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support the channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the 104% t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.